five of the six are pending uh, criminal charges. We are now in absolute shock to learn that they were all released without being charged. This violence was clearly premeditated. At a minimum, felony assault charges are in order. Not to mention the illegalness of setting a military-grade smoke bomb off in a government building. Also, the six arrested here is still an individual responsible for tasing who hasn't even been arrested yet, even though many videos show him tasing somebody. If the violent, unlawful behavior is allowed to continue without repercussion, we are headed down a very dangerous path of lawlessness. Terry and I stand in agreement to demand these criminals are charged and prosecuted. We demand justice and that our right to exercise the First Amendment peacefully are protected even though they do not align with the views of others. May God guide us all to stop this madness. It is time to unite and restore accountability and enforce the laws. God bless our leaders, military, police, first responders, and all who desire a peaceful nation. talking about the March for Trump now with the victims. I want her to describe a little bit, just take a minute, what the intent of the rally was and you know how it kind of went sideways. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Allison, and this is Elisa. We were the organizers of that event, and our intentions were to bring everybody together, every race, every color, every religion, and really any political party that was willing to function in peace. And Elise and I both came with our teenage kids and we talked about it and thought, oh, it can't be as bad as we think we've read and people say, sensational journalism. But it was. And as soon as the chaos started, the fear that was ignited and penetrated this area was real. And the fact that these kids have walked away without any ramifications for their actions is unheard of, and it's not sending a good message to our kids. It's not sending a good message to the generation that is going to be taking care of us, making the laws, when we are elderly people. And I don't know about you guys, but that frightens me. So with that said, I want to thank Jonathan and Don for putting this on and pushing forward to try and bring those guys to justice. Yeah. Each of the victims that you're the, the, the letter from Tammy and Terry, as well as the victims you're about to hear from, have all filed police reports, made statements, have witness statements, pictures, video. I mean, I don't know how you could not charge people after the, the amount of evidence that the police have collected. And by the way, the police have been great. I'm one of the vi uh, witnesses, and the police have been great. They've called me a bunch of times and taken my statements. They've told me that they're sending all of this stuff to the authorities, which we're going to talk about at the end of this. And so it's not the police that charge. Everybody needs to understand that. It's it's the county attorney or the city attorney, because we're in Ramsey County and the city of St. Paul. So without further ado, I now want to introduce one of the victims who was very brave to show up today. She doesn't speak much, she said, in front of crowds. So have, uh, have patience with her, but she's very smart, and she has a very great statement to give. I was not prepared. 
After all, I live in the land of Minnesota nice. Why would I anticipate experiencing violence, especially in our state capital? I was in the crowd right over there, under the arches, listening to the speakers when the protesters tried to push through into the rotunda. They were organized. My thoughts moved from, you've got to be kidding, to really frustrated. When the protesters became aggressive, it was fear coursing through my veins. Fear inducing was to watch their lack of civility turn dangerous. To see a father protectively outraged because his daughter had been hit in the face by a protester, frightening. To witness the flash and menacing snap of a taser, frightening. To watch in disbelief as the club reached out to taser a victim, horrifying. To see faces banged up and bloodied, frightening and hear people suffering from the effects of mace and chemicals sprayed on them, frightening. I came here for a rally, a peaceful event, but when that missile-like object came flying right at me, it was true fear. As I instinctively tried to avoid being hit, thoughts flashed. This is it. I'm done. And as it hit my head, I'm dead. Being hit by that, horrifyingly frightening. These protesters were not only organized for disruption, they came prepared to drown out freedom of speech, frighten, intimidate, incite violence, and cause physical harm. Outrage is that with victim statements and the plethora of video evidence, not one thug has yet been charged. One can only wonder why that would be. For what reasons are these criminals not being pursued? Is it because of someone's last name? Pressure from other places? Or is it that the government officials responsible just happen to agree with the cause of the protesters? Dangerous, antisocial, and terroristic behavior is being tolerated, not only in the streets of our great nation, but now even within the walls of our very own state capitol building. To allow these thugs to go unchallenged will only serve to further embolden them with their violent behaviors, thus continuing to put the law-abiding at risk. For our government officials not to follow through with charging these criminals, to hold them responsible for their actions is behind, well not to hold them responsible, is beyond reprehensible. I challenge them to do their job, and I challenge each person present to contact Thus, hold our government officials' feet to the fire by making your voice heard. Feel free to contact Attorney General John Coy at 651-266-3222. Thank you so much for listening. God bless America. John Choi, it's not, and his, uh, he's the uh, county attorney we're going to call out at the end of the singer. It sounds like Kathy's way ahead of us there. Um, by the way, going up to stand by that sign, like, I love that you're doing it. Like, that's a long time to stand and hold the flag, but that guy's committed, I tell you. Um, another one of the guys who got mace in the eyes, and this is, uh, he, he and I become personal friends after this happened because I'm one of the witnesses to what happened to him, and I was over in the after it happened, I was over with the police, and then finally the paramedics came over at, by a drinking fountain, and, and Kelly must have used four or five bottles of water pouring through his eyes. I mean, it was brutal. And do you know that he just got his full sight back a week ago? It took him two weeks to get his full sight back. I mean, they, these are these are felony assaults. This this isn't this is serious stuff. Yeah. And uh, I'm just amazed sometimes at how it's being handled. Anyway, this is what Kelly sent. Um, he's uh, he's indisposed today, and he's very concerned about this whole rally. 
I was watching the speakers in the rotunda when I saw a young lady and her friend run past me after she was hit in the face by one of the cowards who came to disrupt the planned peaceful event. And you're going to hear from that victim shortly. Uh, hit her very good friend, her, mother, her mother's best friend. I then handed off my sign to a friend and went into the hallway where, where those were trying to shut us down. For about a half hour, I stood next to the Capitol security officers at the bottom of the stairs, staying between the rally attendees and the protesters. Suddenly, they pushed down the stairs, and as, I, and, and as I tried to hold my position, one of those cowards sprayed pepper spray right into my eyes at point-blank range, blinding me for over an hour and causing my eye to burn for the rest of the day. It's possible that whoever sprayed me was the one arrested and held for disorderly conduct and eventually released and followed the following Tuesday. I'm told by the, and I remember they're working with investigators on all these charges. I'm told by the investigator that despite him and others being released without charges, the ongoing investigation may lead to charges. I'm hoping that those involved in this justice system understand the seriousness of these premeditated, deliberate attacks on us citizens who are merely there to exercise our constitutional liberties. I spent 22 years in the military to help ensure those liberties, and I won't stand for a bunch of cowards using violence or threats of violence to try to cause me harm. You're up. Yeah. Yeah. I hope that those that will be prosecuting this case can imagine what it's like to be pepper sprayed, tased, punched in the face by thugs who are wearing masks, hoods, and goggles in an effort to conceal their identity. When we piece together the evidence, the, the hours of video showing threats via their chance signs and actions, the use of weapons, the websites encouraging violence, the actions of the Antifa here and across the nation, our justice system has an amazing opportunity to make a statement, to set an example. Let's hope they don't miss it. Ke Kelly. His name is James. Is it Brunskar? Yeah! I just want to start off, and uh, I was really, uh, the day that I was, came to the rally, I was just expecting to sit down and you know, enjoy it and uh, enjoy the speakers. And I was asked by Conrad and uh, another, uh, as far as the Vietnam vet, if I would volunteer for security. And uh, I'm retired to be Iraq war vet, and I volunteered because I'm also a sheepdog. I don't know if a lot of people know that. Yeah. I definitely am an active Second Amendment uh, believer, and uh, like I said, as far as a uh, sheepdog basically is a person that guards uh, fellow people and themselves you know, from harm, physical harm, and they say the last thing I ever want to do is have to use my firearm, but uh, like I said, I'm prepared in case I do. Uh, but anyway, uh, when I was at the rally, I was asked to do security. And uh, so I was actually guarding the other side of the rotunda over here. And there was other group of patriots that were guarding that. We had people up also, too, up in the uh, upper rotunda area above the rotunda and keep an eye on things. And they said our attention was just basically if people got out of line, because uh, we had a permit, and the permit basically said that they had to keep 100 feet away. And so we could have a peaceful rally. Well, there's people that want to mix it up right in here. And I had one in right in my face, uh, a couple of ladies, and uh, they were booing, and uh, they saw I was in my uh, was in my military combat jacket that I wore on the aircraft carrier Truman, and uh, they were spitting their tongue at me. They spit in my face, but they just, you know showed disrespect to me. And they say I kept an eye on them and made sure that they got out, didn't get out of hand. But they say I told them to leave because they shouldn't have been in there. And then uh, once the people were sprayed with pepper spray, I went over. I could smell the pepper spray. I heard. The, firecrackers go off and I also saw the smoke as a result of the smoke bombs and I can see the effects of a fellow Vietnam vet which uh, I love like you wouldn't believe because they were not respected given the welcome they should have when they came back to America. served in World War I and World War II, and my dad served in World War II and actually passed uh, Christmas Eve in 2015, I miss him dearly. But uh, anyway, I carried on tradition, I spent 20 years in the Navy defending this country, and I defended for being a country of laws. 
and it disturbs the heck out of me to see that we've descended into lawlessness, not only from our highest office, but the offices as far as the state legislature. And it disturbs me like you wouldn't believe, because, and this is an example as far as the vice presidential candidate's son being involved in this whole thing, and he getting off with just a slap on his hand, is just like the children of the elite are above me or my family or my fellow patriots is disturbing. Yeah. Because I did the same thing, actually the same way. When they had their wonderful rallies as far as the March for Women and whatever, I didn't go out and stir things up. I let them do what they wanted to do. But yet they decide to come here and cause disruption to you know go after people that are just trying to have a peaceful protest and enjoy the speakers and also to celebrate our constitutional system and that we constitutionally elected another president is beyond me. They say, I wasn't, they say, a Trump fan at the beginning. I came on toward the end. But like I said, I support my president, I support my leaders, I support my police, I support my first responders. Because they are the people that are supposed to be holding our laws and taking care of us and God bless them for what they do. And he was rinsing out his eyes along with another one right beside him, another guy that got sprayed too. And another one was an airborne guy that spoke during the rally and he spoke, he got a little bit effect of it. But like I say, to see that go on was the very disturbing. And then we had, after that, that was come, they decided to go around and come down this other side and try to go in this, this side and, uh, you know, assault us. But luckily, a bunch of vets as well as myself and good patriot backed us up and they couldn't come in the rotunda. Instead they went down the stairs, but the whole time they were yelling, effing racist. They put down a poster on the side down here saying, y'all racist. But yet, who are the fascists? We weren't. We were trying to be peaceful. They were the fascists. Because I've seen fascists. of law and order and unfortunately we need to see that from our public officials as well as we see it from our citizens. I was a Boy Scout. I was raised as far as to serve this country and I have a simple code that I go by. It's called honor God, honor and take care of my family and also to honor and take care of my country, defend my country and I've done that. Hoorah. And I appreciate as far as you guys coming out here for the press conference and uh, God bless, like I said, our first responders, our police, and our public officials. I was hoping we see justice. Yeah. Thank you, James. That was very inspiring. Now, the last of our victims to speak um, is the young 17-year-old girl that got hit, and as we have all explained, she's uh, she's just afraid to come. And uh, probably you know, the pressure of maybe she's 17 or so, she's in high school. And, but, but you'll hear from Allie, who's going to speak for her, and is a very good friend with the family. She's also afraid to come here, because this, this was not the kind of place she thought something like that would happen. So without further ado, here's Allie again, who's going to talk for her. Up until about 11 o'clock last night, Riley was going to come and share a story, and she was overwhelmed, and her biggest point was there were no ramifications for the action of the protesters, so she had fear that they would be back here today. These are her words as close as I can recall. Riley's a 17-year-old girl who came to the Capitol on March 4th with her dad to support some of her father's friends to encourage unity. In her father's efforts to expose his daughter, all of four feet, 11 inches, to the world of politics and to explore the freedom of our First Amendment, she was met with extreme adversity. Let's start with Riley's words. It's important for people to understand this. What, what this is, what upsets me the most, is that I was standing in the Capitol, what's supposed to be a safe and sacred place, doing nothing, doing nothing wrong, and not wearing or carrying any political signs, which if I wanted to, I have that right, that freedom. The protesters had their right to wear black, cover their faces, and attack me without any reason. She asked, Dad, how did the protesters know that I was, who 
I was with, what I stood for. Could, I could have been one of them, I could have been working for the Capitol. I walked over to see the commotion, and with seconds, she was blasted in the face by someone's fist. Her glasses were broken, and her nose was swollen, and mace in her eyes. Strong as she is, she went up one level and decided to continue being part of the rally. If Riley did this, or any other child that was not associated with Tim Kane, that child would have been punished, <clears throat> and most likely with a felony, which would have limited the quality of life. This act of violence against a 17-year-old girl is not acceptable from any person and should be dealt with accordingly. We don't see Riley back here today to share her story because she had fear. And she said, why should I go back to a place where I was attacked? Why would I put myself in a position that it was so volatile? If the actions were taken to reprimand the behavior of these protesters, understand I would be there, but this is not acceptable behavior. <clears throat> Knowing they walked away with no discipline, I do not have very much faith in our system. My rights have been imposed upon, and my freedom has been restricted. Wow, wow, 17-year-old girl attacked in this is the rotunda of freedom here. This represents freedom of expression right here. This is our government. The chair of our party did a lot of work to help get the press involved here. But I want to make this statement after all the victims spoke. This is our statement. This is the reason we did this thing. We demand that Ramsey County Attorney John Choi, the city of St. Paul attorneys, and any legal authority with jurisdiction prosecute these six rioters that were arrested at the Minnesota State Capitol March for Trump event. And those arrested include Linwood Kane, son of Democratic Vice President candidate Senator Tim Kane. I'm in jail. Okay, now I'm going to bring up the fun part of the program. <laughs> Keith Downey, come on up here. Hello everyone, my name is Keith Downey, I'm the uh, chairman of the State Republican Party. Uh, I attended the rally three weeks ago and was witness to these things uh, as well. And we're here to officially lend our support uh, to this effort uh, in support of the, the resolution that uh, Jonathan just read. Think about it. Masked agitators, physical assaults of innocent people in this wonderful building during a peaceful rally for the President of the United States to shut down free political speech and all the while pretending to be anti-fascist. How utterly hypocritical. Sadly, this disturbing trend of violence is incited by Democrat leadership themselves. Assaults at political events is worsening, and if the authorities refuse to enforce the law in this case, it will only get even worse. Counter demonstrations are one thing, but physically attacking a peaceful political event inside the people's capital is a dangerous sign of just how far left and radical the Democrats are becoming. Former Democrat Vice Presidential Candidate Senator Tim Kaine himself has vocally encouraged the resistance. And his son, after participating with the agitators here, was reported to be physical with the police, chased and had to be physically detained after resisting arrest. In a statement, Tim Kaine said that his children fully understand the responsibility of demonstrating their political views peacefully. There was nothing peaceful about what Linwood Kane did. And something smells really bad. Yes. If the Democrat vice presidential candidate encourages these kinds of protests, and then his kid gets a free pass for physical violence at one, something smells really bad. Yes. Sadly, this appears to be just the beginning of what we're going to face. 
the Democrats continue to radicalize, inciting their so-called resistance against democratically elected officials, including the President of the United States. For the party that supposedly prides itself on inclusivity, tolerance, and love, we see just how hypocritical they are. Releasing violent agitators when one of them is politically well-connected shows just how corrupting the Democrat influence has become. We join with these victims today in demanding that equal justice under law, nothing more, equal justice, be applied in these cases and that the Ramsey County Attorney and the City of St. Paul Attorney ignore all political influence and fairly charge these individuals. stand in support of civil discourse and send a message to Democrat leadership across our state that the radicalism and violence we see in other parts of the world is not going to be tolerated here in America, even if backed by the public. We wanted to treat this as a press conference, so I'm glad if uh, members of the press have any questions, I'm glad to take them here. Anyone? All right, thank you very much, everybody. Justice. Thank you, Keith. Very, very kind words and a kind support of this program. Next, we're going to, now the legislators, uh, some uh, are here today, some could not be here, um, but they're the ones that, uh, Don and I, and especially me, I hit the Capitol the last two weeks and I went to everybody's office all around the Capitol and said, is there, is there some kind of legislation we should do about this? Because we do have rules using the Capitol and all that kind of stuff. So Nick Zerwas is one of the guys, you're going to hear a letter from him in a minute. He's working on increasing the, uh, the uh, penalties for the crimes of blocking highways and stuff. But this all happened after he did his bill. So they're taking a look at this again, but there's some really good letters that are gonna come up now. And Barb Sutter, she there somewhere. She was. Barb has a letter from Kathy Lomer, who is uh, on the safety committee. Hi everyone, thank you. Um, I just wanna also say, I, I'm currently the secretary of the party, and I, I couldn't be more pleased to be here. I was unfortunately not at the rally three weeks ago, but those of us that weren't and heard what happened were horrified, so I thought it was really important to be here today. I've been asked to read a letter from my, uh, and I can say friend, um, Representative Kathy Lomer. She's from District 39B in Stillwater. She serves on the Public Safety and Security Policy Committee, very apropos. Um, Kathy writes, thank you all for coming today. I regret not being able to join you. I do support your efforts to call on Ramsey County Attorney John Choi and St. Paul's City Attorney to follow through and charge the six individuals arrested on March 4th in this building during a peaceful gathering of citizens from the state of Minnesota who had gathered to show support for our president, Donald J. Trump. I was one, and of course I'm talking about Kathy, I was one of several speakers that day and I experienced hearing the chaos and bedlam created with shouting and the use of foghorns. I saw the videos of the police asking masked men to remove those masks and leave the building. I heard from our peaceful, law-abiding citizens who were tased, maced, and told of the smoke bombs that were thrown in this building. Six individuals were arrested because they were breaking the law as they assaulted these citizens. This cannot be dismissed or excused, and these individuals should be charged with the crimes that police arrested them for. We have had similar incidents where people have chosen to block our freeways and throw objects at police, 
and others have subsequently had those charges dropped. We cannot continue to have a peaceful society where this type of behavior goes unpunished. For this reason, I, and that being Representative Kathy Lomer, authored House File 1066, which changes the penalties for blocking a freeway from a misdemeanor to a gross misdemeanor. We citizens believe in the rule of law, and we know that we cannot continue to turn a blind eye to what is transpiring here. Again, I applaud your efforts and I stand with you in calling for these individuals to be charged for their crimes. We ask that you would do the job that the citizens of this state pay you to do. That from State Representative Kathy Loma. Thank you. Representative Cindy Pugh. I'm State Representative Cindy Pugh, and I want to thank you so much for being here today. I'd like to offer a special note of recognition to those of you who were here three weeks ago today as well, to pass, and to pass along my sincere appreciation from many of my legislative colleagues wanted to be here today but couldn't. I'm especially grateful to those of you who came to the rescue of fellow citizens in need as their peaceful assembly came under attack at the March for Trump rally held here at the state capitol. I'm here to thank law enforcement for their extraordinary work to protect attendees on March 4th. Their ongoing efforts to bring the perpetrators of the crimes committed to justice and for their preparedness for today's event. Let's just give them a round of applause. We're so grateful for them. We the people greatly appreciate all the members of our law enforcement community and respect your critical role in upholding the rule of law here in our state capital and throughout the state of Minnesota each and every day. Thanks also to Jonathan Anastad and to Don Dickerson for the amazing job that they did and the leadership they showed in pulling this event together. And lastly, but most importantly, I'd especially like to thank the victims of the attacks for coming forward, Kathy and Jim, and for the others who really wanted to be here but couldn't today. It's definitely not an easy thing to do, and we're so appreciative for their having come forward. We greatly appreciate their willingness to work with law enforcement in building their case against those who perpetrated the crimes on our fellow citizens. Friends, each of us has a responsibility to assist in this ongoing effort in any way that we can. Please Ask yourself, if you were here three weeks ago, who might I know, or even if you weren't here, who might I know, who might have witnessed one or more of the acts that were perpetrated a few weeks ago? If you can think of anybody, please reach out to them today. So three weeks ago today, I was honored to have been one of the speakers at the rally. And while waiting my turn to speak, I witnessed those who were clearly here to disrupt and thwart our peaceful assembly and rally in support of our president, Donald J. Trump. For those of you who are here, I'm hopeful that you heard me speak above the disruption. We literally, every one of us who spoke, had to shout into the microphone and we heard afterwards how most of our words weren't heard. But I was speaking um, passionately about one of my constituent, constituents, Patriot Freedom, Fremont Gruss, and instead of just telling you about him and the inspiration he has been to me personally, and in my service as a legislator, I thought it would be wonderful if he could join us today. So I was so delighted that he accepted my invitation. And I just want to thank Fremont right now for having been here and for your service to our country and to the state of Minnesota. Combat 
veteran, and that his company liberated the Czech Republic. And I told you of President Trump having offered inspiration to a 92-year-old World War II veteran that one person could make a difference in changing the trajectory of our nation. I told you of Fremont's four foot by eight foot yard sign staked on a highly visible main road next to his home that was vandalized with large black spray painted swastikas. And I told you of the awesome response he received from neighbors passing by, honking their horns, shouting their approval, while he was offering his infamous V for victory, as Winston Churchill did, as people were driving by and as we were putting up his new sign. It was an awesome experience, and a, a one I'll never forget. So friends, we're here today because Fremont and his fellow members of our greatest generation have passed the torch to us, and along with it, the legacy of freedom. As citizens, we must embrace this charge and to do what is right. We must stand tall and strong as they did on our behalf, and we must speak up. We owe this to our future generations who are counting on us to do just that. We have a responsibility to act, and that's exactly what we're all doing here today. So I want to thank you again for being here to demonstrate your support for and for offering ongoing encouragement to our dedicated law enforcement officers and to demand those who have perpetrated violent crimes against peaceful rally participants are held accountable and prosecuted to the full extent of the law. May God continue to bless America and the great state of Minnesota. Thank you. Be here. He's at a wedding. You know, he's, at, he's at that stage in life, man. Everybody's getting married and having kids. And God bless him for, for being that young. But he's a very young legislator, let me tell you. And, uh, but anyway, he, he really wanted to be here today, but he's got a gal, uh, Alexandra, who's going to speak uh, for him and, and read you a letter. Hello, everyone. I'm Alexandra, and I have a statement from, from Elk River, Minnesota Representative Nick Service. And here's his statement. Hello everyone, and thank you for attending today. My apologies to you that I am attending a wedding out of state this weekend, and I am unable to attend today's rally. I want to thank all of you for showing up to the Capitol and demanding accountability. For over a year, I have been trying to demand accountability as well. I have worked on legislation to hold accountable the people that violate the law by blockading our airports and closing down our freeways. I am convinced the vast majority of Minnesotans believe these actions should be prosecuted and the perpetrators should go to jail. We cannot allow lawlessness to take over. We cannot allow blockades or violence to be tolerated under the guise of free speech. It is time for us to stand firm and demand justice. Next there was Republican. Interesting thing he's going to read uh, from a, we consider him just a patriot, he's a hero. Or you're going to introduce Joe, okay, he's going to introduce Joe and Joe's going to say a few words to us, okay. Thank you. I'm uh, Gary Hogre, and I'd like to introduce my friend Yaskin Bosch. He was born in Afghanistan and raised in the high mountains. As a young adult, he traveled in the, uh, to the Middle East uh, countries to work. While working in Lebanon, he met his American family. After surviving a civil war uh, and numerous life-threatening events, Yaston was eventually able to come to the United States, a dream he never thought would happen. Yaston has written a book about his life. From the sales of the book, he uh, helps Afghanistani women and children. In his own words, I want to give them hope. Yaston. Uh, 93, he could not make it today here, but I'd like to show you a picture. To 
to him. In Afghanistan, we work, we eat. Can you hear me okay? We don't work, we die. I, when I, I went through a lot of many struggles to come to America where people were free. I was so proud when I got my citizenship in, I ran down the street of St. Paul with the American flag. It was so funny, there was uh, 40 other people who was there also swearing at the same time. And I thought, what happened to those people? None of them was out there. Um, but now, I see America being changed. People who do not understand true freedom want to change it. Today, our freedom are taken from us little by little. When our peaceful support of Donald Trump was disrupted by the six rotators, uh, what I call them terrorists, or about it brought back my memory to me of the Lebanese Civil War, which I was in it. Dragging their feet, John Choice's office sent the decision to charge the six returns the disruption to the city of attorney office. I was, I was, there was criminal that the six felons can do can to dis disrupt the March 4th peaceful rally supporting of President Trump were wearing masks. They were spraying people with the mace, smoke bombs, and were loud and disruptive. At the, at the very least they should do should do be charged with the family. Fellow Americans, we need to do, we need to defend our rights and our freedoms. John Choi and the city of attorney need to do the same. They need to realize that we have right to. God bless America. Thank you. Candidate Hillary Clinton, 
and selected Democratic Senator Tim Kaine to be her Democratic Vice President running mate, son, whose son was the, one of the six Democratic violent thugs arrested on March 4, 2017, right here in St. Paul. These were black hooded Democratic violent thugs who were arrested for assault on peaceful Republican citizens just trying to exercise their God-given First Amendment rights, the freedom of speech, and freedom of assembly. American citizens, I remind you, who were simply trying to support their duly elected president, Donald J. Trump. The Supreme Court of the United States has held that the First Amendment protects every American's right to conduct peaceful public assembly regardless of their race, creed, or color. We call on Ramsey County Attorney John Joy and the St. Paul City Attorney Sam Clark to do their job. Yeah. And prosecute, prosecute the six violent hate crime Democratic thugs who were arrested at the Minnesota State Capitol at the March 4th rally. According to their website, the Ramsey County Attorney's Office protects public safety through aggressive prosecution. Well, that is On their website, the Criminal Division says the following. In the courtroom, we provide the highest quality legal representation to our community and seek justice in each and every case. Our attorneys represent the state prosecuting designated misdemeanor and gross misdemeanor crimes and all felonies alleged to have been committed in Ramsey County. Felony crimes are the most serious crimes, including severe assault, rape, robbery, murder, which are punishable by a year or more in prison. Nowhere on their website does it say unless the perpetrator was a Democrat assaulting a Republican. Yeah. In, fact, in fact, Sam Clark, the St. Paul City Attorney's own website, statement, excuse me, stated mission statement says the following. The mission of the St. Paul City Attorney's Office is to deliver outstanding legal services to the city, among other things. Protecting public health, safety, and welfare by protecting uh, by welfare by effectively prosecuting misdemeanor level crimes. I looked on the website. Nowhere could I see unless the alleged perpetrator was a Democrat assaulting a Republican. Yeah. It's not there. Therefore, I call on Ramsey County Attorney John Choi and the St. Paul City Attorney Sam Clark and St. Paul Mayor Chris Coleman to not only do their job and prosecute to the fullest extent of the law, but evaluate, excuse me, elevate this obvious democratic hate crime violence to the level of the hate crime that it was. We're going to use their rules against them. Otherwise, here's Bass Bensky Hodges across the river in Minneapolis, instructing her police department to stand down and make no arrest at the Donald J. Trump fundraiser on August 19, 2016 in Minneapolis at the Convention Center, where attendees were verbally assaulted, spat upon, their clothing sprayed with spray paint, and a 74-year-old gentleman thrown into the bushes. Since when did it become open season on Republicans in Minnesota? Yeah. I call on the Democratic Party leaders from Mark Dayton and Ken Martin to the most freshman elected Democratic House rep to publicly denounce their party's violent hate crime militant wing and to call for a halt to their party's violence before someone gets seriously hurt because the blood will be on their hands. My name is Rick Rice. I'm the National Committee Man for the Republican Party of Minnesota. I challenge Ken Martin, Ken Martin, chair of the Democratic Party of Minnesota, to man up and denounce the militant arm of the Democratic Party of Minnesota for being violent, hate crime, Democratic thugs. Woo! I challenge Ken Martin, chair of the Democratic Party of Minnesota, to man up and denounce his fellow Democrats, State Attorney General Lori Swanson, Ramsey County Attorney John Choi, and St. Paul City Attorney Sam Clark for letting three weeks 
go by with no charges being brought against violent, hate crime, democratic, militant thugs. Yeah. Yeah. I got news for you. There's a new Republican sheriff in town, and it's no longer open season on my fellow peace loving Republicans.
lot of great, and all I can tell you is this guy has some really great comments about what we're, what we're going through right now, trying to get some justice for this program. With that, Chris Barton. Thank you very much. It's a privilege to be here in the people's house. This is a sacred place. We know from a study of history that civilization depends upon the rule of law. We don't want to live in a nation that is not guided and governed by the rule of law. I'd like to add a little historical and legal perspective and context to this case, this very important legal case, which I think is an important chapter in the history of the state of Minnesota, because this was an act of political terrorism that happened in, in the people's house. Right. And it hasn't been properly reported. The stories I've read on this are fake news. They have misreported what happened and they've left out the context. So let me add some of that. So when I was at Harvard Law School, there were interesting people there. And two of them tell tales of the future of this country and this state, depending upon our actions. These two students who I passed in the hall every day were Barack Obama and Neil Gorsuch who will currently, very soon, sit on the U.S. Supreme Court. So, Mr. Obama, yes. thank, you, thank you for our president, Donald J. Trump, who supports the rule of law. Mr. Obama became president and led one of the most lawless administrations in the history of America. Let me give you an example of one of the things they did. They ran an IRS that illegally shut down hundreds of conservative political groups spinning the 2012 election. When Congress attempted to investigate these crimes, the evidence was destroyed. Look it up. Hundreds of hard drives were destroyed. No one was prosecuted. Hillary Clinton committed multiple felonies. Has she ever been prosecuted? No. We're seeing a similar pattern now with political terrorism across the United States. At the University of California, Davis, a peaceful speech was shut down by violent protests. Protesters wearing masks that look like bank robbers. Where have we seen that before? Right here. Who was arrested? Who went to prison for that? No one. Then the University of California, Berkeley. I was a student at Berkeley in grad school many years ago. They wrecked the student center. They had fires going on. People were beaten and maced. Was anyone arrested? No. Did the police arrest anyone? No. Is anyone going to jail for death? No. Middlebury College, small, sedate college, a speaker shut down there, also by violent protesters, like the ones in Berkeley, like the ones at UC Davis, all wearing masks like bank robbers, and all committing violent crimes of political terrorism and all escaping legal justice. So this is a pattern. The other pattern that we see, as we see in, in these crimes, not only did these people come here, these crimes were carefully planned. They were prepared to attack people. That's why they wore masks. Why else would you wear a mask like a bank robber? They were hiding their identity to avoid legal justice. But the other thing is, look at these sites that they're picking. Davis, Berkeley, Middlebury, St. Paul, Minnesota. These are Democrat Party machine jurisdictions where they believe they would not be arrested, and if they were, they would not be prosecuted. And I want to know who made that deal. Was a deal made with them that if they came here and did this, they would escape justice? start to investigate these hate crimes of political terrorism. We cannot have local corrupt jurisdictions letting these kinds of criminal acts go unprosecuted. The First Amendment is the First Amendment for a reason. It is the most important of all amendments, along with the Second Amendment, to protect our liberty.
The news media has failed to report this accurately at all. It has been spun as some kind of duel, as some kind of counter-protest. No, it was a, an act of political terrorism, and it should be properly reported. By the way, did you know that under Minnesota statute, I believe it's 609.735, it's a crime to wear those masks. Did you know that? You could have been arrested just for wearing the mask. Look it up. Yes. Of course you can't wear a bank robber mask in a public location. Why would they do that? They were preparing to commit crimes and hide them. They should have been arrested for wearing the mask, and they should have been searched. The tasers would have been found. The smoke bombs would have been found. The mace and the tear gas would have been found. The crimes would never have occurred. They could have been prosecuted for those crimes. So we have wearing a mask, a crime. We have assault, punching people in the face is a crime. Using mace and a taser in the commission of crimes is more criminal activity. Resisting arrest is another crime. Are these crimes going to be properly investigated and prosecuted or not? Do we have rights in the state of Minnesota or don't we? Does the Constitution apply to protect us so that we have free speech rights in the house of the people of the state of Minnesota? Will the rule of law prevail? Yes, it will. Thanks to you. Thanks to our brave veterans who fought for these rights. Let's hear it for our veterans. The people of Minnesota are good and kind and hardworking and diligent and fair-minded and tolerant people. We deserve a state and local government that is as good as the people of Minnesota. And with your efforts, with our efforts together, we will get that government. Thank you and God bless you. Thank you, Chris. We're going to hear from another legislator via letter, and that is uh, Mr. Sinus is coming up to read another letter. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Dave Sina. Uh, Candy, my wife Candy and I attended the rally three weeks ago. In fact, we sat right here in the front row, and we our intent was to come to this rally to uh, give our respect and our support to our duly elected president, the highest office in the land, and we uh, witnessed firsthand these violent acts by these six individuals. And so I, went, uh, I was asked to read this letter from Representative Mary Franzen from District 8B. She is the chair of the subcommittee on child care access and affordability. So this is what uh, Representative Franzen says. I'd like to share with you folks today. Happy Saturday. Thank you for attending the event today. Please forgive me for not being able to attend. The First Amendment gives us the right to peaceably to assemble something that went missing on March 4th. Individuals should feel safe coming to the Minnesota State Capitol and for expressing their First Amendment right. Sadly, lawlessness and chaos took over that day. The young, elderly, and those in between were assaulted simply because, because they did not think the way the left thinks. The left wants to continue their assault on the First Amendment and pushing the boundaries to where we are today. Today, we are asking for accountability and justice. Being the son of a U.S. Senator does not mean one can bring his friends into a peaceful rally, cause chaos, hurt people, and get off scot-free. Today, we ask prosecutors to do their job and set an example that we will not tolerate the infringement of the right for people to assemble peacefully. Thank you, Representative Mary Francis. And Janet, uh, the way she's uh, out of breath right now, she must have run the whole way here, but she just got here, and Janet by offer anyone wants to say a few words. Here's Janet Byhoffer. You guys deserve a medal for coming out today again. Thank you. Thank you.
thank you, thank you. Chris Bart mentioned the First Amendment. That's very true. And that First Amendment applies to people on all sides of the political spectrum. And when one side decides that they can interrupt the other side, that is totally unfair. And that word, unfair, is one that we can use over and over again when it comes to our God-given national rights. It is unfair to not publish our letters. It is unfair to block the state highways. It is unfair to go against someone who happens to think differently than you do. We don't behave like that. We are the core today of the American public. You think about it. The Republican Party is the core. And the last four letters on Republican are, I can. Last four letters on American is I can. And this country was founded on people who say, I can, I can fail, I can pick myself up, I can try again, I can. And that attitude does not exist on so many places on the planet. I can. I can win, I can lose, I can fail, I can start over and over and over. So keep those four letters, I can, in mind. And part of I can is also I have the right to say the truth, my beliefs, and what's in my heart to anybody. And I have the right to be respected when I say that. So just know that you are here. Those of you who took the heat the last time, thank you so much for standing up and not letting the officials get off easy or ignored. We have to push back. And if we don't push back, we won't have to worry. We'll just be more pavement on the ground. And I'm not ready to do that anymore. So thank you very much. today is uh, a guy on a long time man he is uh, he's one of these guys he's in the trenches working for us all the time representative Matt Dean come on up man thank you so much for being here I was born on the Iron Range and I was raised on Rice Street which is the street right out in front out here and my dad and his dad and his dad ran a bar about four miles north of here. When I was a little kid sitting on Schmidt boxes, loading the beer in the, in the coolers, I never thought I would work at this end of Rice Street. But I can tell you it's great to understand that the people at that end of Rice Street, around the bar, at Dean's Bar, had a really good handle of what was going on in the state, much more so than the people on this end of Rice Street, in this building sometimes. But it's a beautiful building and it's a great place to work. This is where I get to work every day. This building was built over 100 years ago as a memorial to people who died in the Civil War. And if you go in the governor's reception room, you'll see the Battle of Gettysburg and the people who gave their lives and the, uh, so that we could have a state, so that we could have a country, so that this could be here. Think about what this building looked like over a hundred years ago today with mud on the outside and horses and buggies, people pulling people from all over the state to get here. And they'd look up and they'd say, wow, this building was built as a memorial to them. This is hallowed ground. Look directly up at that dome. See the chandelier? That's lit once a year on May 11th on Statehood Day once a year to celebrate this state. This building is a celebration of freedom. And yet it was vandalized. And why did they do that? Why did they do that? They did that because it strikes at who we are as a state. They knew that that would damage and hurt us. And that's really, that's a terrible thing. I was talking to my great friend, Nick Sirwas, who can't be here today. 
carrying a great couple of bills. It says something you shouldn't have to say. If you're, if you're driving down the freeway, you should be able to drive down the freeway to get to the hospital without somebody stopping your way. If you're trying to get to the airport, you should be able to take off in an airplane without being harassed and stopped. If you, if you block the traffic on I-94, or if you shut down the airport, or if you shut down this capital, you should expect to go to jail and get a bill from the government. What is, what is so hard about that? What is so hard about that? Well, what's going on? We had a, a liquor store that tried to open a day early for an hour, and the full hammer of the government is put on them. But you can shut down the freeway, you can shut down the airport, you can shut down this building, and you can get a pass.
citizens, we have the spirit of truth on our side to be the wall to maintain this great nation of ours for our community, families, and future. I challenge you to persevere because we have a conscience. The other side, yeah, I don't think so. There is this thing called the Constitution that sensible people like us abide by and believe, even though a justice system thinks they know better. No one is above the law. We, the people, put you on notice. No power on earth is greater than a mind and soul reawakened. Our Constitution begins with we, the people, not us, the government. For those sorts, there is a very special place reserved for them that suits their crime. In Proverbs 25, 28, it says, He who has no rule over his spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. As concerned citizens, we demand justice. Let us bring this nation back to greatness it once possessed. Pray for President Trump and our leaders and make America great again. Make America great again. Make America great again. Well, Ron and I just really want to thank everybody for showing here today. And the bottom line is that we worked really hard to get some legislators here. You saw some here, some sent letters. But I'm not so sure our total legislator really under legislature understands how serious this is. So please, wherever your legislators are, whether they're local reps, senators, give them a call, send them an email, say, hey, it's outrageous that the violence that happened in your capital where you meet all week long in session happened to your average citizens and voters. Please reach out to them. And if you want to, send letters to the editors of the papers all around here in St. Paul, because the charging authority is the county of uh, uh, this county, Ramsey County, and the city of St. Paul. Those are the charging authorities. They're the only ones that can charge these people. Send letters, knock on their door. <clears throat> Believe me, if, if this goes much longer, we're going to call another rally. We're going to be sitting outside Ramsey County Courthouse in front of John Choi's house. Awesome.